Hello everyone, I'm Marsha Mott and welcome to the UF Health Wellness University webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today as we discuss common ear, nose and throat problems in children. I'd like you to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Thomas Schrepfer. Dr. Schrepfer is a board certified otolaryngologist and an assistant professor of head and neck surgery at the University of Florida in the Department of Otolaryngology. Dr. Schrepfer attended medical school at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. And after obtaining his medical degree, he completed an anesthesiology internship and general surgery residency in Switzerland. He then pursued his otolaryngology residency at the University Hospital in Zurich, where he focused on head and neck surgery. He completed a pediatric otolaryngology fellowship at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Then that, he followed that by a pediatric otolaryngology fellowship at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta. Prior to joining UF Health, Dr. Schreffer was a research fellow at Children's Mercy Hospital and the Craig's Hearing Research Institute at the University of Michigan. During his more than 10 years of clinical and research and training, he gained experience in multiple areas of ENT, ranging from facial trauma to pediatric endoscopies to open airway surgeries and more. If you have questions for our speaker today, you can submit those questions anytime using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. I know this is going to be a wonderful webinar, so feel free to submit your questions at any time. And at the end of the questions, I'm going to go ahead and read those questions out loud. Dr. Schreffer, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you so much for joining us today. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, the really friendly introduction. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I think you already or hopefully saw the, the presentation from my partner, Dr. Carlin, some months ago about the ears. I'm just going to try to cover everything between your nose and your throat, all the way down to your throat and um, the voice box. So it's going to be all of upper area related topic. And I really hope I can give a little bit of insights and, and show you what we see in clinic and, and what you probably need to be aware of at home if you have, if you have any children. Um, hold on. There we go. Um, so I created a little overview. We're just going to get started with uh, some anatomy to, so we can, we can talk about introduce some common uh, terms and, um, and words that we're going to use throughout the presentation. And then we just start out with what is noisy breathing, what do you need to know about it, when do you have to be concerned, when do you want to address certain things with your primary or, or even see us. Um, most common um, issue or diagnosis we actually see, especially in, in small kids or infants that associate with noisy breathing will be laryngomalacia. It's a really interesting topic. I have some good videos to show you. Then we move on to throat issues such as sore, recurrent sore throat, uh, tonsillitis, and of course, obstructive sleep apnea. And we're gonna round it up with nasal related concerns such as snotty nose, runny nose, or when to think of um, more complication of uh, sinusitis. Um, as you can hear quite excellent, that's because I'm Swiss. So I really, so bear with me. I hope you, you do understand me. If you have questions, again, feel free to, um, text them or uh, move on to Marsha and then let me have them answered. Um, so just to make it short, so all the serious subs are pretty much true. So I'm a, I'm a landlocked, tiny country, heart of Europe. Um, second oldest democracy, interestingly, right? The US, the first one, and we were the second. Um, again, all the serious subs are true. We have delicious chocolate. Uh, we have the beautiful mountains, happy cows that uh, they eat the, the green grass and of course the cheese. All right. So before we dive into, into anatomy, I'd like to discuss a bit more what's a child. So, because for a lot of my partners or, I mean, in partners that work in the adult world, they just see a child as a, as a tiny human or a small adult. That's not, I see it different, that's not true. So if you, if you Google what's a child, that, that's what shows up. So it's literally a screenshot I took when I just Googled what's a child. Um, I mean, it's true, it's a small human, right? But what is small. Um, so definitely have to dive deeper and, and, and determine that. And, and the other thing, of course, even adult can be a child if they behave a certain way. So really funny what shows up if you just Google what's, what's a child. Um, if you were a little bit more an accurate answer, then CDC actually does it quite well. So, so when we talk from a neonate, it's basically a newborn, um, up to day zero when they were born and, and, and the first month. And then that goes, it fluently goes over in being an infant and you, you are an infant for the first year of your life. 
And after that, you you toddler. We all know the toddlers. These are the the tricky ones, right? Because they, they tend to run away and, and do naughty things. And then um, after the age of three, we usually determine it's a, now it's a child. And and the child is basically everything between the age of three all the way until they're, they, they're going to hit puberty soon. And, and then after we have puberty or lessons, and then hopefully by the age of 18, they can be considered as an adult. So that's, that's a little bit of the definition. The, the reason why I, I'm kind of almost picky about it and and really want to use certain terms because a snotty nose in a in a newborn is different than in a snotty nose from a 13 year old. So, or a sinusitis in a three year old is not a sinusitis in a 15 year old. So, so it's really important what are the symptoms and at what age, and then you can really kind of narrow it down. What might be the reason? What may go on, and how do you want to approach and treat it? All right. So, anatomy. Simple, we all breathe every day. Um, as an adult, we breathe like 15 to 20 times a minute. So um, the airway literally starts with right here at the tip of your nose. So if you look inside your nose, you have two chambers, right? The left and the right nasal chamber, nasal cavity, then the sinuses. Uh, as an adult, we have the frontal sinus, we have the cheek sinus, then the so called ethmoid sinus, which is the sinus between your eyes and your nose. And then all the way back, almost in the center of your head, is something called the sphenoid sinus. And then it takes almost like a right angle curve down. And then we enter the throat or here, um, or the pharynx, that would be the medical term. And then if you go further down, then of course there comes the voice box. That's when, when the so-called air digestive tract divides. Um, when the food goes down the esophagus, the air has to go down the windpipe. And then of course, once the air goes down the windpipe, it splits up into left and to right lung. So to make it quick, um, we as an ENT, I, I actually kind of love to say that my specialty ends right here, which, which is also true. It's, it's the upper airway. So the upper airway, upper respiratory tract is where, where we're focusing on. And, and then um, issues related to lower respiratory tract, we're happy to help, but it's usually more of a pulmonology issue. So today we're just going to focus more on the upper part. And these are the terms and areas that you, that you probably just want to be aware of. Excuse me. All right. So, so what is noisy breathing? So overall noisy breathing, it's, it's common. I mean, we are headed. It, it doesn't take much. And maybe you, you catch the flu, you have allergies, and the nose is blocked. And the nose is blocked, you, you may breathe more through your mouth, and then when you fall asleep, then your wife kicks in like, hey, it stops snoring, right? So it's noisy breathing. Eventually, it's a whole realm of certain things that we can just consider. It's noisy breathing. The question is, when do we have to be concerned? Um, and what can cause it? And is it always there? Is it something new? Or in what time frame did it show up? And um, so it can be something completely benign, like, again, um, an adolescent that just snores and then eventually wakes up and goes to school. Or it can be an, an infant, like a three, four, five month old that has a squeaky noise and, and struggles with feeding. So that's when, that's when you really I have to be aware, we'll, we'll get there. All right, so noisy breathing, basically can break it down in three terms. And the three terms, the nice thing about it, if you listen, you, you can determine from where is the noise coming from. So, so the first one would be a stirter. Stirter also is like a snore. So it's like a grunting sound and, and literally means almost like a snoring sound. So you know it's probably coming, it's probably coming somewhere from your nose, the throat, or any area above the voice box. So that, that's what we consider a stirter. And again, it's a, ground, a grunting sound or a snoring. And a strider, that's when it gets really interesting, especially for an ENT. So a strider is, it's, it's not a wheeze, but it can be like a high pitched sound. And then you wanna, you wanna figure out, is it when you take a breath in, if you take a breath out, or is it there when you, when you breathe in and you breathe out? And that actually tells you there's probably an issue somewhere at the vocal cords, like the voice box right below it, or really close to the windpipe. And then if you go further down, a wheeze is usually, so class, classic wheezing sound is, is somebody with bad asthma. That's, so they exercise and then they're like, <gasps> that's when the lung gets really tight and you, you try to breathe out, but you can't. So, so that, that's what we consider, consider a wheeze. Um, Cause, again, we mentioned already a little bit, um, 
simple the flu, the cold. Um, it takes, especially in a small child, the airway is small, right? So, so that's where actually the, the term small human is true. Everything is smaller. So it doesn't take much of a swelling or an issue and you don't have much space for the air to go through and, and then it creates the noise. So we all know group um, uh, had that been there, seen that. Um, so it's basically, it's a viral infection affects the mucosa, so the soft tissue in your windpipe, right below the vocal, the vocal cords or the, um, um, the voice box. And, and it swells up and it gets narrow and that's when, that's when the, that fucking cough um, shows up. If you take a closer look, so if the swelling stays there and causes issue, you can also call it a subglottic stenosis. Stenosis means it's a narrowing that um, used to be dynamic because you used to be fine, but then you got sick um, and it stayed there. Even though the virus is gone, it's still really narrow. So, so that narrowing can be either because you were sick or trauma. Like if you have a breathing tube down um, for whatever reason, and that tip of the breathing tube can actually injure the tissue and cause scarring that may give you that narrowing. Um, another thing, very important in children, um, foreign bodies, right? If, if something um, goes down your windpipe, gets stuck there, you have an acute, like a sudden onset of a blockage or narrowing that can cause um, the noisy breathing. And then last but not least, the floppy tissue. So you can imagine if there's, there's anything flopping around when you're breathing, it gives you the noise. Um, we're definitely gonna, gonna talk more about it. So again, um, but when do we have to be concerned? Again, we all know, um, we, we've been snotty, but when, when do you really, what do you have to look out for? And again, here really matters at what age. So, so this is, let's say for first, for parents, first child, uh, I, I mean, I would be concerned too, if, if, my, if my child like, Reasons uh, a three month old is not supposed to wheeze, right? Um, supposed to be healthy and, and do three things, which would be sleep, breathe, and, and eat, and, and poop, of course, in between. Um, but things you definitely want to look out for um, is it all to breathing? Like, does, does it take a lot of effort to breathe? And, and that can start with like the nose, the flaring of the, uh, the, flaring of the nose. Um, it, get, it may get worse. You can actually see the chest or the upper chest here, the skin, really be, be pulling in. And, and if you struggle with breathing, you can imagine you also may struggle with feeding because it's called the SSB cycle. So suck, swallow, breathe. So a baby um, supposed to do all these, thing, these three things actually at the same time. But if you struggle with breathing, you come out of your rhythm and then, and then you may struggle with, uh, with feeding. So you, might be poor feeding, so it has maybe takes the bottle for five or ten minutes and then has to catch the breath. Or is so tired because of all the breathing, it falls asleep and doesn't want to eat anymore. Um, being irritated. So the reason there is because if you can't breathe, you, you almost you almost tight, you almost tense and, and, and on action and and of course you're irritated. Um, and then what happens if you if you so literally worked up and, and continues to try to breathe? You burn a lot of calories, um, so that means for for an infant, for a baby, that bottle every three hours may not be enough calories for you to properly gain weight. So, so I do see kids actually they, they start the downwards on their growth chart, and then then of course we are concerned. So these are definitely things that um, that should be a red flag and and, and uh, kind of enough reason for further investigation. So we mentioned it already a little bit. So all these things we actually may see with laryngomalacia. So laryngomalacia is a, an interesting beast. Um, it, it's fairly common. The good news, it's, it not always has to be bad. So I, I have two, two really nice examples. So I really hope you can, you can hear this child breathing. So he's tiny. I think it was only two or three months old and, and, and you can hear, it's like the, the he starts out with the grunting, almost like a snore, congestion, grunting sound. And then in between, he has that high pitched squeaky sound. Just gonna play it again so you can listen. That's example number one. 
And then example number two, a uh, really cute one. She's more on the other spectrum, less snoring, grunting, but more on the squeaky, squeaky spectrum. Let's see if you can play that. I think it's kind of, it sounds loud, I guess, when she is feeding. So that's almost textbook, textbook Laringo Malaysia. So the term Laringo Malaysia uh, just means floppy voice box. Um, and you will see, let me show you why that's the case. So how do we, it's, it's inside you, right? So how, how can we visualize the voice box? Um, so the good news in our clinic, uh, we have a brand new storage tower. Um, it's beautiful. So what we can do, we can use a teeny tiny camera. I call it the floppy spaghetti because it's, it's literally the size of a spaghetti and it's floppy, so there's nothing sharp on it. And then we can go through the nose. We can see what's going on in the nose. You can see the back of the nose. Then we take that turn, go down the throat, and then the voice box is right there. And the way it looks, it's, it's just like that. So that would be the back of your throat. And then up here would be the tongue. And that's your voice box. So ideally you see a wide open voice box. You can see the vocal cords and you should be able to see straight down the windpipe. But with Laringe Malaysia, you see all this extra tissue is not supposed to be there. And whenever, now you can imagine when you take a deep breath, you literally suck that tissue in and it vibrates and it gives you that, that squeaky sound or sometimes even the congested snoring sound. Um, and then here illustrated, uh, I stole this picture off the internet, um, illustrated if there's a floppy tissue, of course, you have a narrow, more narrow airway, so you may struggle with breathing and it creates the sound. All right, what can we do? So it really depends, it really depends on all the symptoms and how, how the child presents. Um, if the child is just noisy, but otherwise happy and growing and doing just fine, then we do nothing. So I'm, I'm a big believer in best medicine, sometimes just doing nothing. Um, but there's, there's a certain degree, right? Um, of course, if you struggle with feeding, we also speed up. If somebody speed up, speeds up, well, you can imagine that also the S, you may have some acid reflux. So whatever was in your stomach came right out and what's right there, it's your voice box. So you actually may irritate and, and cause some inflammation of your voice box. And then that can also lead to that floppy, floppy extra tissue. So, so the next step would be, if there's concerns with feeding, speeding up, would be a PPI, like a, a, a acid medication. I usually start up with like 30 days and see if that helps. Takes away the irritation and, and decreases the, um, uh, the speeding up and, and hopefully then gives the child some time to grow out of it. So the good news with uncomplicated laryngeal Malaysia, everybody outgrows it by the, anywhere between the age of 12 to 24 months. If you uh, there, there's different um, sources, some say by the age of 18 months, but um, 12 to 14, so that's when you usually outgrow it. The other thing, of course, besides speeding up, if you, if you struggle with the SSP cycle, so if you struggle with sucking, swallowing, breathing, you actually make a joke. So if somebody takes a sip or a child, you take the bottle, the child immediately coughs and chokes on it then that might be a sign of laryngeal malaysia as well. So there's, there's actually literature out there that 74, 75% of children with laryngeal malaysia, they do have a certain degree of dysphagia. Dysphagia means uh, issues with swallowing. So that means liquid milk or formula may, instead of going down your stomach, it goes to the vocal cords or even into your windpipe. And that's, that's not good. Um, so if the concerns for that, then we can always get a, a smaller study with, uh, with our awesome speech team a chance. Um, and then the third thing, you may have sleep apnea. So with laryngeal Malaysia, you can imagine if there's a floppy tissue, it's like having a blockage. So when you lay flat and you, you may literally choke on your own tissue right there. So if all that's the case, then, then sometimes we have no other choice but, but tell the parents, I'm sorry, but we, we should probably fix it. And the way we fix it, we take the patient to the OR. Um, you need a highly trained pediatric uh, anesthesiologist. Here's Dr. Dooley. Um, he's amazing. That's one of my residents. Um, and then you, you take a look straight through the mouth. So it's called direct laryngoscopy because you use a metal tape tube, tube to, to push the tongue down and get a straight view onto the voice box. And that's what you see. So you, you can see 
that's not a happy voice box because you can't even see the vocal cords. So everything is, is floppy and curled up. So that's textbook style laryngo Malaysia. And um, here's another picture you can see. It's really tight and curled up. And all we do is we actually don't have to do much to, to help improve. So you just have to release, it's like a flower that wants to bloom. So you release the tissue and that's how it looks. So here, that's now a happy, happy, happy open voice box. And um, there is 90, more than 90% of those children usually do a, do a lot better and helps them to avoid quicker. So that would be the surgical solution. Um, uh, yeah, and, and again, happy, happy to talk more about it and, and answer questions if any questions about that. So moving on from, from a problem this morning in smaller children, such as infants, um, we can now move on to more throat related issue. We all had, I'm pretty sure everybody has, uh, has a history of sore throats. So what are adenoids and tonsils? So um, you can take a tongue blade or a toothbrush and, and I'm pretty sure you, you've seen your own tonsils when you take a look in your mirror. It's basically a round ball, um, uh, the tonsils, we have two of them in left and to right. They're a little bit hidden by but the soft pellets coming down, so they, they just hang in there. And the adenoids, that's something we can't see. So the adenoids, it's a tissue. If you could see all the way back in your nose, it's hanging right there in that right angle corner where you go down into your throat. So here in the picture will be right there. Um, and to make a long story short, it's, it's, it's a tissue filled up with immune cells. So they basically unite. Um, so our whole body, right, we have, we have our uh, lymphocytes, our um, white blood cells that help us defeat infections. So adenoids and tonsils is basically a castle or fort, a fort full with those, with those um, uh, immune cells to, to help and defeat infections. So that also explains why they're usually bigger in a small child, because what does a small child do? They love to take things in their mouth, especially their, their hands would probably just touch something that they shouldn't have touched. Um, so it's important to have them. Um, but once we get older, um, like middle school age, there's not much, so there's almost no biological um, function to them because even if you take them out as a, at a young age, um, you still, your whole throat and nose still has plenty of, of um, lymphatic, like Im immune cells. So, but, but it's important to have them and, and we'll definitely talk more about it. Um, Again, they, they can become enlarged, usually with an infection. So simplest thing, getting a cold, um, catching up a virus, um, especially when, you, when you're a little bit older, right? A teenager and you meet certain people and, and yeah, um, uh, then mono, mono is a big thing. So uh, probably the most important virus to know when you're a teenager or college age um, would be mono, like EBV, so the Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, the disease, when you get really sick, if it's called mono, mononucleosis. The reason why it's called mononucleosis is because, uh, so the monocytes is a type of immune cells that they change their shape, they look really funky um, with the virus. That's why it's called mononucleosis. Also known as kissing disease, I'm pretty sure everybody has heard of it. Um, then when it comes to bacteria, we all know streps, probably the most important one. Um, usually sore throat starts out with um, with a virus and, and then if, you, if you're unlucky or you got exposed to somebody who had strep, there's a high chance that you can get it. And these are the ones that usually show up with these typical white markings on the, um, on the tonsil, but I'll, I'll show a picture later. And another thing is actually affecting the nose and the adenoids would be cigarette smoke. So, so smoke is really, it's just, it, it's just bad. I, I don't think I have to, to mention that. It, it just really affects everything, especially in a child. Symptoms if you have a sore throat, um, tonsils can get bigger. You, you may sound like there's, there's a potato in your throat. Um, sometimes not only the tonsils may swell up, all the lymph nodes may swell up and it looks like you have like a chain on, on each side of your neck. That's especially bad and, and impressive if you have mono or EBV. That, that's when really just all your lymph cells, all your lymph nodes, including the tonsils just swell up and are huge. Um, oh, fun side story, by the way. Uh, I'm pretty sure all of you know, know Roger Federer. Um, so he, um, he was on a streak, right? He was winning everything back in the early 2000s. But then 2008, he lost Melbourne. The reason why he lost it was because he was sick. 
So this poor guy, he actually caught mono. And that's why he lost the finale against um, Rafael Nadal in, um, in 2008. All right, um, back to the topic. Um, I'm not, I don't have to talk more about it. So we all, we all, I'm pretty sure we all had a sore throat. Um, children, same, they, they can complain about sore throat. What, what a small child usually does when they're in pain, they, they stop eating and drinking. Um, so definitely look out for that because hydration is the number, fun, number one thing you want to do if somebody's sick. Um, then if you're sick, we should go to the pediatrician or primary care and, and, and they treat us. They, they can swap, they can do a fast test, see if it's strep and, and treat with antibiotics. If it's negative or you all are doing okay and you may have a red throat and all that, you can just wait it out. And definitely supportive care. You can be generous with time on and um, enough fluid. Um, however, if it's an ongoing issue or it happens over and over again, at one point you definitely want to decide, is it worth it? Do you really want to take all the antibiotics? You just want to get rid of your tonsils that might be the main issue for, or the main reason for your issue and your suffering. Um, so that's when, then we, that's when we see you and, and we usually have criteria. So it's the Academy for, for ENTs including, and, and also the Academy for for pediatricians to come with, with criteria to, to determine who, who is a safe or a good candidate to take to the operating room. Because even though we do um, thousands of the surgeries every year, it's still a surgeon still has risks. So it's not like, I think in the 50s, my mom was one of them, just when everybody hit a certain age, okay, next tonsils out. Um, so we don't do that anymore. Um, so you have to have at least if it's within the current year, at least seven sore throats, and they have to have certain symptoms. So you must be really sick, um, associated with fever, maybe in large lymph nodes. You may see the exudate, which is the white stuff on your tonsils, um, or they were even all positive. If you had like six or seven positive straps within the year, then you're an excellent candidate for surgery. Um, however, it's on, on the first view, it sounds like, Man, isn't there a lot of infections before I can get surgery? So, so here's where more softer criteria play a big role. Um, and it's important, a child who's, who's always out of school, that's not good. Um, so we usually really determine, so we have an extra fact that's not mentioned here. We usually ask how many days of school have you missed? Um, or do you, especially for teenagers that have lots of tonsil stones, so then it's more of like a chronic tonsillitis, like a chronic inflammation without be getting really sick, but ongoing, like suffering, suffering in terms of build up of tonsil stone, nasty breath, uh, scratchy feeling all the time. That, that can be a good reason to actually have the tonsils removed too. So there's, there's definitely good reasons and a good indications to, to address that from a surgical standpoint. And, and your pediatrician knows, and that's when, that's when they usually refer you to us. Um, since you're talking anodes and tonsils, um, we all know sleep apnea. Um, to make a definition of sleep apnea, so sleep apnea can have different reasons. You can, so sleep apnea basically means you don't breathe while you sleep. Um, and it can be complete, so you just stop breathing. Um, for adults, it would be stopping for more than 10 seconds in, in, in children. I think it's five to seven seconds or two breath cycles. So basically stop breathing, missing out on two breath cycles and then catch your breath again. So that would be complete. But there's also the partial, which is breathe a little bit, but not enough. Um, that can have two main reasons. One would be the obstruction. So literally somebody just closes up your airway and the other one can be central. So for whatever reason, your brain doesn't tell you to take a breath. Um, and an excellent candidate to show you my little friend over here. So he has all the symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea. His tonsils were, I'm not kidding, they're like meatball sized. So, so they had, he had no space. So there was no room for him to, um, to really take a deep breath. So he had to use his chest. So you can see he, like, he really, he uses all the muscles in his chest to pull that air because it's, it's all occluded, it's, it's all blocked. Um, what are the symptoms? So we can, we can roughly say there's, there's two aspects aspect of sleep apnea. Um, one, 
what do we see at night when, when the child's uh, asleep and what happens at, during the day. So at night you, you may see, you may hear snoring. Um, I had parents that were not aware that the child was snoring, but then they all of a sudden, they went traveling, had to share a hotel and they were like, holy moly, I wasn't able to catch a single minute of sleep. That, that child, that was rough on me. So, um, so snoring can be present, doesn't have to be. Um, you may hear choking, gasping for air, uh, being restless. I call them a little helicopter, right? Because they turn around or you, you may find your child upside down in the bed the next morning. Um, constant mouth breathing, but also also symptoms like a poly turned child that all of a sudden um, is bedwetting again. Um, and then sweating and, and night tears. These are definitely nighttime symptoms that may um, give the idea or show you, okay, there, there might be something going on. Then throughout the day will be having a rough start in the day, so waking up with a headache, um, being grumpy, being not rested, sleepy, um, almost like ADHD symptoms, but they're actually related to not getting a good night rest. Um, so they can, there can be some behavioral issues that, uh, that can lead you to, oh, maybe it's, it's sleep related and not, not ADHD or missing out on riddling. So, so that's definitely things to look out throughout the day. Um, and then causes. So sleep apnea, especially obstructive sleep apnea in a child is completely different compared to an adult. Um, so an adult, it's usually being overweight or having an unfortunate anatomy, maybe like a big neck, a short neck that, that just obstructs your airway um, because of, of, of the pure anatomy. In children, it's, it's most likely almost always uh, big adenoids or tonsils. So in a healthy child. Um, of course, you have syndromic kid, kid with like uh, craniofacial abnormalities, then, then, then it's different. But in an otherwise healthy child, it's usually adenoids and tonsils. Um, so you can see, uh, so this kid are definitely mouth breathing, uh, blocked nose. Um, and if you take a look in the throat, you see these meatball sized tonsils. So, so there's, no, there's no space to breathe for this poor kid. A treatment, again, it depends. It depends. How old is the child? Is there any anything else going on? Is otherwise healthy? And what do we see in clinic? And, and what do you observe at night? Um, so I, because you have your child every single day, every single day, you you know your child best. So if, if I have a parent telling me, "Hey, the snoring is so bad, it's out of control. He wakes up ten times a night. He used to be party trained. He's now bedwetting again, and he's just grumpy every morning." And then I take a look, look in the throat and I see huge chances, then one, one plus one equals two, right? So, so that definitely adds up. So that for me, it, it's pretty suggestive of sleep apnea. and then we can discuss next steps. Um, if we're not sure, you just want to be in the safe state, we can always order a sleep study. A sleep study is basically, you go and see Dr. Abby Wagner, she's off uh, 39th Mac Park and, and you get all, wired up and they measure everything um, surrounding sleep and breathing overnight. So you stay there in the sleep center, um, connect the two cords and then they measure and, and can tell you how bad is the sleep apnea. And then there's medical versus surgical treatment. So if the main issue is the tonsils, there's not much you can do with medicines. There's, there's just nothing that shrinks them. Um, if it's just the adenoids, then there is. There's, there's a certain combination of medication that actually do an excellent trick in shrinking that tissue and helping you breathing better through your nose. But again, if, if you decide, okay, let's just get rid of those, those tonsils, it helps. So the, the cure rate or the, the rate of improving the symptoms is extremely high with taking out the adenoids and tonsils. So that would be before you take them out and that's right after. And you can see, so immediately, already immediately after the surgery, you can see why this child is probably gonna breathe better. Um, now to just round things up, we can talk a little bit about sinusitis. So with, with the term sinusitis, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm, I'm struggling because he, here's the problem with the sinuses. A child, a newborn doesn't have sinuses. Um, so the sinuses, they develop slowly. Um, for example, a frontal sinus and the sphenoid sinus, we only get those once we're hitting the age of like being a teenager. Um, so a runny nose, in a child, it's extremely common. And, and I'm pretty sure everybody knows, everybody who sends their child to daycare knows it. Um, 
the question is when is it worse and when when do we have to look out for for something else or when do we seek further treatment um so again main reason exposure to viruses it can be bacterial but it's usually a virus maybe combined with allergies and then again i have to mention it it's it's the smoke it can just it's it's just a really huge irritant to your pure, uh, poorly mucosa and tissue inside the nose. Um, and then, including myself, I always thought, okay, I'm, I'm stuffing, can't breathe because there's too much mucus. But it's before the mucus actually happens, the tissue gets irritated and puffs up like a balloon. So it just narrows up the inside of your nose so that you, that you struggle with breathing. That's, and that's why those nose sprays that you can buy over the counter, like the, the Afrin or the oxymetasonin, that's why it helps at the beginning really well, because you spray it in there and it closes up all your tiny vessels and then you decongest and, and eventually open up the space to breathe. The problem with those sprays, you are not, you can never ever use them for too long. And too long means depending on age. So as an adult, you can use it for like five to seven, but then you have to stop. And then the younger you get, of course, the shorter you want to use those sprays. And it's not a long-term solution either. But of course, if you can't breathe at night, you definitely just want to open up your, your nose and, and, and to help yourself with that. Um, again, to come back to, to the term sinusitis, I, so I assume if you go to the pediatrician, they tell you it's an upper respiratory tract infection. That's correct. Because the infection is not just limited to, to like a cheek sinus or um, something else. It's, it's always a combination of your whole upper respiratory tract. So that's definitely correct. So it almost always starts off your virus and then it may get worse. Um, a child can, you can have fever, stinky breath. Um, like really, as mentioned here in the lower part of the slide, it's like having a bad flu. You're just, you're just not, not well. So if that progresses and you turn into a true sinusitis, or what I prefer to say, rhinus sinusitis, because it's always the nose first, then maybe you sinus it. Um, so you definitely want to think about it if the cold, like cold-like symptoms get worse, or they got better, and then you have them again within like a week or two, or you've just been suffering, 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 and you're hitting the 10 days mark. Then, then it's probably time to like, okay, 10 days suffering, I don't want that. There, there's something, there's something else going on. So that, that's definitely when we move from like, acute onset or acute illness, probably caught by a virus or cold, moving to something more, like a super infection with a, with a bacteria. And then again, you, uh, you may see fever, thick, nasty, um, drainage from the nose, mucus, maybe some pus, um, may even go down the throat, uh, leading to nausea. Um, and then headaches usually has to be a kindergarten. Kindergarten or early school age child that can actually really tell you, hey, it's associated with a headache and then, and then um, being tired all the time. Um, that's something you have to think about if there's just one side running. So if the child's perfectly healthy, but one side always stuffy and there's thick, nasty stuff coming out, you have to think of a foreign body. Um, because just the cold, it usually affects all of it. So you're sick on both sides, but just one side especially in a toddler or, or a younger child, they, they, there might be something up there. Um, I think it just, oh yeah, two days ago, we just pulled out a door stopper of a child's nose. That, that, was, that was interesting. They, uh, I just think whatever they find on the ground, they just put it somewhere. Or yesterday, the child, they put a rock in the ear. Um, so children are definitely, definitely funny. All right, what can you do? Um, Basically supportive care. So, so best treatment, supportive care, number one, again, fluid. So make sure you drink enough. And then you, again, acute phase, you can decongest and, and never forget allergies, especially here in Florida, it's terrible. So you, you definitely wanna get started on that. Um, so you can easily do a CERTEC. If you're super stuffed and it's thick mucus, uh, flush your saline. Um, if you don't wanna swallow CERTEC, there's also a spray that literally has something similar to CERTEC in it. So it, it, it tackles the allergies in your nose. But in my opinion, a more long-term and best solution, if you always stuff up here, try eight to 10 weeks, the combination of single and flow nase or nasal nex. Um, just like a, a nose spray with a steroid in it and then, and then the singular, the Montelukast. And, and these, 
that medications, the combination of those medications actually is shown to shrink the adenoids. And again, in a, in a really small child that gets labeled as a sinusitis, it's just, it's just not true. Um, in 90% of those cases, let's say a, a two or three of a sinusitis, it's, it's the adenoids. It has nothing to do with the sinus. It's, it's just the nose is blocked, but from behind, from, from the adenoids. And then first line treatment, try the medication, medications don't work with a side effect because that medication now is a black box label on it. So, so not, it's not ideal for everybody, but for the majority. Um, then we can definitely discuss to, 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 to take down the adenoid tissue. Um, so, so that was that. It was my quick overview of some issues that are airway related that we see. Um, now, I just want to show you what happens if you get referred to us. So you, you might, if you're lucky, you see my partner, Dr. Collins. If, if you're not so lucky, then you have to deal with a guy with an accent. Um, I'm kidding. I, I really tried to be nice. Um, so that's our clinic. Um, once you, you see in the front desk, you, you get taken in by our awesome MAs. Um, they take your vitals. Just let me imagine it's a child and not an adult. So they take your vitals, take you, your height, because we want to know, um, is the growing, are you doing okay? Um, on your growth chart, we take the temperature to see if there's nothing else going on. Then you get to see one of our brand new rooms. Then the MAs do the intake, ask you some questions, make sure we're up to date on, um, not insurance, I mean insurance too, but uh, up to date on your pharmacy and past medical history and, and current medications. And then usually we come in and, and take a look and see what's going on. So I hope, I really hope I was able to, to show you a little bit what's the upper airway. So what does an ENT kind of deal with when it comes to, to airway and, and what are the most common things you, you may see or think of. Then noisy breathing, um, especially important in, in infants, small children. Um, what, what are the adenoids and tonsils for? What issues can, how, yeah, what, what issues are we dealing with and how can we address those? And, and what's the sinusitis? So again, sinusitis, I think the first thing I have to take away, a child with sinusitis is not an adult with a sinusitis. So it's, it's really, it's, it's different. So there's a gray zone and, and you have to think of different things. Um, and then of course, what are surgical options? Because usually when you get referred to us, that means you primarily exhausted all the non-surgical options, and he now thinks you actually may benefit from from uh, from something else. Um, what to remember? Um, I think it's like with the ears; the majority is self-limiting and doesn't need treatment with antibiotics. Um, so it's actually, I think, only the most recent data, right? I think only twenty to thirty percent of the sore throats are actually. Um, a strep or a bacteria that needs antibiotic treatment. But either way, I mean, the moment you, you show up with a sore throat and, and, and an irritated tonsils, you usually get a swab to determine if it's a strep or not, and, and then you know. Um, sleep apnea, huge impact. So be, even, even with just laryngomalacia or some, as an infant, if you have sleep apnea, you, you just not get the rest you need. And especially children that that's supposed to perform in school, if they don't get the rest and their brain can't recharge overnight, it can have a huge impact. So, so that's definitely something that needs needs to be addressed. Um, and then, uh, high success rate. If you if you do decide you want to move on with surgery for adenoids and tonsils, the success rate is high, but it has risk. Um, but in if you pick the right patient. They, they do well and, and it's usually the right thing to do. And then again, noisy breathing, it really depends at what, what age group we talk about and, and how it sounds and, and what else is going on. All right, I'm, I'm more than happy to take any questions or elaborate further things. All right. Um, all right, can you, can you guys see me? I can't remember if I turned on my camera. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, one of the questions that we received, I, I got some um, in advance, but please feel free to go ahead and um, 
submit them. And you can go ahead and turn off your screen sharing whenever you get a second. But one of the questions I received in advance says, um, does um, asthma contribute to tonsillitis and or will having a tonsillectomy help improve a child's asthma? So that's a, it's an excellent question. So it's, it's the other way around. So it's, it runs in the, it's called the uniform airway, uni, like unified airway disease or because everything's connected. So if you have a bad sinus disease and you have constant post-nasal drip, you can imagine it, it constantly tickles down your throat and, and maybe into your lungs and, and actually causes your lung to be sick. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so that's, that's definitely possible. So if you have um, issues going on up here, then your lungs not not happy. Um, so we've seen cases where where we, we fix the sinuses, fix the nose, or even the tonsils, and they did better from a breathing or from a lung standpoint. So that, that's definitely that's definitely the case. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then someone submitted a question: um, Are there any problems with the child being on like daily allergy medicine because they get a lot of fluid buildup in their ear? Is there any like long term effects from being on an allergy medicine? No. 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 Um, I don't know a single one that should cause any issues. No. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, another question I received was: um, You mentioned that your tonsils and adenoids. Um, protect, um, I guess, against virus or help fight off viruses and, and infections um, as a child, but they don't really fight off anything when you're an adult. So is that like, are they almost irrelevant as you're an adult? Yes, because it's, so we build our immune, so the more contact we get with, um, with the environment, so the, the more we are outside uh, exposed to viruses, bacteria, or so the more, even a vaccine, the more vaccines we get, the more we build up our immune system because the vaccine is like hitting, like getting a virus, you, you stimulate your immune system to build it up. So at a certain age, your immune system, you, it's like upgrading your computer to the, to the newest model or to the newest um, uh, system. Once you reach that point, you're good. And, and, and that, that's what we do as children. Um, and, and that's why, again, I call it, I call it Tonsons and it's the fortress, because that's where you really, you pick up the virus, you take it apart and you present it to the immune system and, and, and then they, they develop the immunity lifelong, hopefully lifelong. Um, but it, yeah, it's usually anywhere between, so it depends what you read. It says age seven to nine, that's when there's adenoids and tonsils, they're okay. Uh, they, they, can be, they can be retired literally um, because you, you, still, you still have your whole throat, everything is full of immune cells. So. So you, your overall whole body immune system is now at a level where you don't need that front line. Okay, so, and this is just a question I have now is, so as an adult, if they don't do much for you, why do you still get your tonsils? Why do your tonsils still get really swollen sometimes if you get really sick? Yeah, so they, I mean, it, it, it's because the immune cells are still there. Um, there's. So ideally, ideally, let's say by the age of maybe eight, nine, ten, ideally your tonsils are the size of, of maybe not a, a little bit bigger than a peanut. Um, they usually just shrink, but they still function. They still function, but they're just small and kind of hang in there and like, yeah, hang in there and, and not do much. Um, but there's, there's patients that are just, they're hyperactive. Um, they may have gotten stimulated too much and just stay huge. Um, the classic one is, uh, EBV, mononucleosis, especially in teenagers, um, they they can blow up. So, so they just the virus is so strong, it causes such a strong in, immune reaction that that those tons just they get so big, and then they actually grow bigger than the blood supply can help them out. So, so they they tend to die in the middle. It, it's really interesting. So you have like a ball of tonsil in there, but have it it's dead and just stays big. Interesting. Okay. Um, and is the, another question we received, um, is the criteria for tonsillectomy the same as adults as it is for children? Depends, right? It, it really depends if you, if the issue is the recurring infections or if the sleep apnea. Um, I mean, it, a child with sleep apnea has sleep apnea. And, and also if you get a sleep study, you get that number, it's called the AHI number. 
And, and in adults, if that number is higher than five, that's when you are considered to have sleep, uh, sleep apnea. In, in children, it's, it's higher than one. So basically, even if you have mild sleep apnea, you have sleep apnea. The question is, do you want to live with sleep apnea or you don't, uh, or you want to do something about it? Um, and if your tonsils are the size of yeah, a walnut, then there's, there's a reason why you're struggling. Um, and again, the success rate with, with the search in children is extremely high. In adults, it's, it's completely different. You may do better, but there's, it's never, you never fix the problem in adult with just taking out the tonsils. Right. And then with, with infections, it, it shifts. So I had my tonsils open when I was 33. The reason why was I just waited for too long. I had like lots of, lots of, I never had strep, but tons of sore throat and scratchy feeling. And, and mine tonsils actually stayed big and nasty. And I had tons of tonsil stones. So once I finished my training, I just asked one of my friends, like, hey, take them out. And um, it's, I mean, again, I was 33. So it was, it was rough. It was 10 days of suffering. But uh, it was worth it. I haven't had a sore throat yet. So fingers crossed, touching wood. Okay. Uh, we just got another question submitted. Um, and I'm curious about this too. When your child is diagnosed with EBV, with the Epstein bar, um, does it ever really go away or is it, does it just lie dormant? That's correct. So it's, it belongs to the, the same virus group as the herpes virus. So we all know the, the source, right? The cold source you can get from the herpes virus it belongs to the exact same category. So, so you may get breakouts and then it's just gonna stay dormant. So, so the classic appearance, the classic mono appearance with the swollen lymph nodes, having like feeling like you got the flu, but instead of the flu being over after seven days, you may have it for 10 weeks and lose Melbourne. Um, so that's when it first shows up. So that's the first infection with, with the virus, the EBV virus. Um, and then once you get older and maybe you're immunocompromised, you get a certain treatment or too much stress at work or whatever. Um, and the second appearance actually that that's it's the skin rash. Um, so that that can be that that, that can be uh, another issue with EBV. All right. That's a good question. I, I appreciate that one. So um, I don't have any more questions that have come in. So uh, I think we're going to uh, wrap it up there. And I thank everyone for attending. I thank you for giving a great presentation and explaining a lot of these things for us. And uh, thank you. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Hi.